Catholic Church. The book documents what he sees as a systematic rejection of pious Orthodox seminary applicants in favor of liberals with questionable attitudes and agendas. This talk from the Chicago Athletic Association is an hour and 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can have your attention, we're all set to start. Once again, you've been reminded twice, but it doesn't hurt to remind you again that uh, the questions are, are written in deference to C-SPAN. This is the book that really has revolutionized a lot of thinking. Goodbye, Good Men, How Liberals Brought Corruption into the Catholic Church by Michael Rose. The comments are really outstanding. Ralph, uh, Ralph McInerney, who has spoken here in the past, says, Goodbye, Good Men investigates the training of priests over the past decades and shows how a shortage has been artificially created by keeping good candidates out and admitting effete and unorthodox ones, the scandal of homosexual priests and bishops now testing the faith and loyalty of American Catholics have their origin in the situation Rhodes describes in this book. Another comment by Jim Hitchcock, professor of history who has spoken several times in Chicago, and I think at least once to Catholic citizens. Few books in the past 30 years have shed more light on the continuing crisis in the Catholic Church, in particular anyone who wishes to understand the pedophilia scandals and how they could have occurred must read this book. Uh, you probably are not surprised that this book received a mixed review in some of our uh, secular and also so-called religious journals, people questioning, including the Catholic New World, which we will get into. The author is certainly a young man who is an outstanding representative of what we at Catholic Citizens want to inculcate. Uh, Michael Rose, the author of two previous books, one term is a uh, the Renovation, Manipulation, and uh, Ugly as Sin. An Ugly as Sin, of course, talks about how churches have been desecrated in recovation. During the past seven years, while editor of the St. Catholic Review, he has emerged as one of the freshest new voices in the Catholic world. As an, an investigative reporter, editorialist, he's illuminated a number of highly controversial issues in contemporary Catholicism, his articles and editorials and essays have appeared in venues such as Catholic World Report, New Oxford Review, Culture Wars, Homiletic and Pastoral Review, Envoy, Adoramus Bulletin, National Catholic Register, The Wanderer, Lay Witness, AD 2000 Challenge, This Rock, and Catholic Dossier. Currently, he's the executive editor of CruxNews.com an internet news magazine and wire service. Uh, he, uh, he attended Brown University in Rhode Island, probably the most liberal university in the world. And I said, sacrilegious as it is and uh, atheistic and everything else. And I said, how did you make it? And he says, it strengthened my faith. And, faith, and as a matter of fact, my graduate uh, thesis was written on anti-Catholicism in Brown University. Give him a hand for that. Graduate of the University of Cincinnati, uh, a degree in architecture, a graduate degree in, in writing. His next book is entitled Priests, and it's going to be published by Safai Institute, and it's going to list 12 outstanding priests. So without further ado, I want to present to you the young man of the hour, the man who really has revolutionized Catholic thought, Michael Rose. Good evening. I assume since this is a, a Catholic citizens meeting, there's some Catholics in the audience tonight. Yeah, you know, it's not architecturally correct to sit behind a pillar. So that's a, that's a joke from my architecture talk. But anyway, 
I want to start by asking tonight, how many of you here have heard of the vocations crisis or the pre-shortage in the Catholic Church over the last decade or so? A few of you, yeah, some of you. So Chicago, it's a pretty well-educated audience, great. Um, you've probably heard um, the dire pre predictions posited by liberal Catholics over the years, predictions that go something like this. In 10 years or in 20 years, there will be so few priests that most Catholic parishes in the nation won't have a full-time priest. Or most parishes will have a mass only once or twice a month. And one Jesuit priest way back in 1966, which was three years before I was born, uh, predicted that the priest shortage will become so acute in the course of the 21st century that uh, there would that the, that the Catholic priesthood might almost disappear. Now, most of us here probably recall many of the shrill warnings we've been bombarded with over just the last decade alone. The priest shortage calls for a solution. The vocations crisis calls for a solution. And what are some of the solutions that are commonly put forth? Uh, ending the discipline of celibacy, that one's been around since the 1960s. Uh, ordaining women to the Catholic priesthood, that one's got a lot of press, uh, especially in the early 1990s. And also essentially replacing priests with deacons, nuns, or lay pastoral ministers. And I think that one's picked up a lot of steam over the last few years here. Uh, but does anyone here really believe that these proposed solutions will end the priest shortage? Will they solve the vocations crisis? Uh, how, for instance, does replacing priests with lay pastors solve the priest shortage? Uh, in a word, it does not. These solutions posited repeatedly by liberal talking heads are geared toward learning to live without the traditional Catholic priesthood, and I think it's that simple. Um, but I've got news for everyone here. There is no vocations crisis. That's right, there is no vocations crisis. And in the words of Archbishop Eldon Curtis of Omaha, Nebraska, the priest shortage, he says, is artificial and contrived. And those are the exact words he used in a watershed article that was published in Our Sunday Visitor in 1995. He claimed that the vocations to the priesthood are indeed out there there are plenty of young men who are not only called by God to devote their lives in service to Jesus Christ and His church, but want very much to answer that call. In fact, many of them do answer that call, only to be turned away. Now, here's how Archbishop Curtis described this situation. It seems to me, he wrote, that the vocations crisis is precipitated by people who do not support orthodox candidates loyal to the magisterial teachings of the Pope and the bishops and by people who actually discourage viable candidates from seeking the priesthood and vowed religious life as the church defines these ministries. And who do you think these people are that Archbishop Curtis is talking about? Who are the people who are discouraging orthodox candidates? That is, candidates who embrace the teachings and the disciplines of the Catholic Church. Who are the people he's talking about? Well, this uh, may come as a surprise to, to some, others it will not. He was talking about the very officials who are responsible for promoting and fostering vocations to the priesthood. We're talking here about vocations directors, seminary rectors, uh, faculty members, and formation priests, those in charge of educating and forming future priests for the Catholic Church. And I don't want to be too broad in my sweep here, I'm not talking about all seminaries or all priests or all seminary rectors. I'm certainly talking about uh, 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 some of them, though. And so is uh, Archbishop Curtis, of course. And how does Archbishop Curtis know all this? Uh, why did he feel that he could make this claim? Precisely because he saw it with his own two eyes. Before he became bishop, he served the church as a vocations director and as a seminary rector. And it was in these positions, as well as in the position of the Bishop of Helena, Montana, and the, uh, later as Archbishop of Omaha, that he came to understand well that the vocations crisis is, as he says, artificial and contrived. Now, one of the most salient points in his 1995 article was that in dioceses and religious orders that promote orthodoxy and do not tolerate dissent, there is no priest shortage, no vocations crisis. On the other hand, in those places where dissent from Catholic teaching is the order of the day, the priest shortage is most 
acute. In other words, orthodoxy breeds vocations, while dissent causes or at least exacerbates the crisis. There are other factors involved, and I don't think Archbishop Curtis would deny that, and certainly I don't either. Uh, but I think, you know, a significant part of the problem is that over the past 30-some years, there has been a systematic ideological discrimination against Orthodox candidates to the priesthood. Now, I'll have to say that I found Archbishop Curtis's 1995 thesis quite compelling. So compelling, in fact, that I undertook to research and write a book that would explore this thesis to try to discover if this thesis were in fact true. What I found was that Archbishop Curtis's thesis was not only true, but I believe it was the understatement of the decade. Uh, in 1997, I wrote a series of articles about Cincinnati Seminary, the Athenaeum of Ohio, and what I found at that time that there were two professors teaching there, one for 12 years and one for 17 years, two professors charged with educating future priests for the Catholic Church who didn't believe what the church teaches, not even by a long shot. Now, I interviewed priests and seminarians who had sat through their classes. I read the class notes. I read six or seven of the published books that were uh, uh, penned by these two professors. Now, the first of these two was Aaron Melovac, a former religious brother. He taught church history and theology. And in just the first five pages of the textbook, that he wrote for use in his course, he ridiculed everything from the fathers of the church down to the Baltimore Catechism, and that's because the Catechism of the Catholic Church had not come out yet. I'm sure that would have been included if it would have been after 1994. He denied the Catholic doctrine of original sin, and he disparaged the tradition of the fallen angels, and that was all just in the first five pages. What he actually taught in his class to seminarians, to potential future priests, of course, was even worse than that. He taught that Jesus' death was not a sacrifice and that Jesus never instituted the priesthood. In other words, here was a professor hired to educate future priests and he denied two of the most fundamental doctrines of the Catholic faith, the ministerial priesthood and the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Now the second of these professors is a sister of Notre Dame, Barbara Fiont, I don't see her in the audience tonight, but uh, she teaches at Loyola, uh, which I believe is somewhere near here. Her seven books, many of which I suffered through reading, and if you'd like to read my reviews, you can look at them at Amazon.com. They all received one star. Barbara Fiond is the name, F-I-A-N-D. Um, her books betray a deep-seated animosity toward the Catholic Church, and especially the male celibate priesthood. She even admitted having problems with the Catholic creed, saying that Orthodox Catholics, maybe some of you might be Orthodox Catholics, that Orthodox Catholics are obsessed with statements of the creed. For example, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Very controversial. She regarded the sec seven sacraments as superfluous, and she refused to refer to God with masculine pronouns. She was an outspoken proponent of women's ordination, and according to seminarians there at the, sem at the seminary in Cincinnati, she left the impression that she wanted no man ordained to the Catholic priesthood, even the guys who went along with her liberal uh, program of dissent. And again, she was teaching there for 17 years. So I found, what I'm saying is I found two professors teaching in a Catholic seminary, which exists primarily, of course, to train, educate, and form future priests, two professors who did not accept many of the basic teachings of the Catholic Church and did not support the Catholic priesthood and, in fact, wanted to reform the priesthood to remake it in their own image. Now, going back to uh, Archbishop Curtis's thesis, one naturally wonders, how many men did these two professors alone turn away from the priesthood? Were they truly fostering and promoting vocations as they were charged to do, or were they destroying vocations? Unfortunately, these two certainly weren't the only problems at that seminary at that time. In fact, around the time I wrote the articles, the rector of the seminary left the priesthood to marry a divorced woman outside the church. A man who left the priesthood to marry outside the church had been in charge of that seminary. And lest anyone think this is an anomaly, a few years earlier, another rector of the same seminary left the priesthood to marry 
And one wonders how supportive of priestly vocations and the priesthood in general uh, could these two rectors have been? Now that was my introduction into Catholic seminaries and I soon came to learn that what I found at Cincinnati Seminary was not at all out of the ordinary. In fact, it was quite common. Uh, more than, probably about two and a half years ago now, I began interviewing seminarians, former seminarians, and priests about their seminary experiences. Again, seeking to explore Archbishop Curtis's thesis that the vocations crisis is artificial and contrived precisely because Orthodox candidates were systematically turned away from the seminaries and consequently from the priesthood. The men I interviewed regarded themselves, uh, most of them at least, as the Orthodox candidate to whom Archbishop Curtis referred. Uh, these men, these were men who were, were loyal to the teachings of the church, looked to the Pope as their spiritual father and leader, pray the rosary, and embrace the male celibate priesthood. Uh, these were men who had no interest in supporting politically correct agendas of the day. And from this interviewing process, I began to see a pattern at work. I like to say after my 85th interview, my yellow light started to go off. The men had described more or less the same obstacles that were being placed in the way of authentic priestly vocations, leading to the Orthodox seminarian's dismissal or to his voluntary departure from his vocation to the priesthood. Now, I want to be clear here and don't misunderstand me. Certainly there are many legitimate reasons uh, to turn away a candidate uh, who wants to be a priest. But I'm not talking here today about a procedure designed to winnow out false vocations. What I'm talking about is a system designed to frustrate genuine vocations because the candidates are perceived by those in control of vocations in some places as threats to their politically correct agendas. Agendas, I might add, that are not agendas promoted by the church. I'm talking here specifically, uh, for instance, uh, the agendas of radical feminism, uh, New Age spirituality, a liberated sexuality, sexuality, and the so-called gay agenda. Now in my book, Goodbye Good Men, I identify the main obstacles that I found placed in the path of orthodox vocations to the priesthood. And this is probably the most efficient way, I think, of communicating the pattern I found. So let me enumerate here uh, first the uh, seven obstacles, and then I'll go back and I'll briefly address each one of these. Number one, a biased application screening process at the level of the diocese or the religious order. This is where the candidate is subjected to the, what one might call a political litmus test. Now, not to determine the candidate's suitability, but to ascertain his level of political correctness. Another aspect of this application process is the psychological evaluation administered to the candidate, oftentimes by psychologists who do not accept the doctrines or disciplines of the Catholic Church, especially the teachings on sexual morality. Third, uh, the endorsement of what has become called uh, the gay agenda and justification and acceptance of homosexual practices even in the seminary itself. This is commonly referred to as the gay subculture. Uh, the gay subculture, that term was coined recently, uh, was popularized by a rector of the Cleveland Seminary who published a book a couple years ago. Number four, dissent among the teaching faculty and formation advisors at Catholic seminaries, as I mentioned in the case of the two professors at the Athenaeum of Ohio. Uh, fifth, the actual persecution of Orthodox seminarians who reveal that they accept the teachings of the church and reject the agendas of political correctness. I say that at risk at this point of sounding like a conspiracy theorist or a black helicopter kind of guy. But uh, actually, I do see black helicopters out there right now. Thank you. And someone can read my mind. These seminarians are identified as posing a threat to the liberal status quo, as I was saying. And they undergo what some have come to call the vocational inquisition. Uh, part and parcel of that persecution or, or uh, inquisition, if you will, is the abuse of psychological counseling in order to bring the orthodox seminarian into line or to make him feel that he is psychologically imbalanced or actually to use it as an excuse to expel him from his seminary. And the last, which might sound almost benign compared to some of the other obstacles, is open contempt for proper liturgy and traditional devotions in the Catholic Church. Now I might also add 
uh, that there are certain man-made obstacles that present themselves even before the orthodox candidate applies to a seminary. For example, the dumbing down of the liturgy. Uh, I know that doesn't happen in Chicago, but you know it does in other places. Uh, poor catechesis, and often the lack of male role models in the church, uh, not to mention the spate of sex abuse scandals that have exploded uh, over the last decade. Um, now, I'd like to go back and uh, address each of these seven man-made obstacles I enumerated above. First, the application screening process, what I call in my book the gatekeeper phenomenon. Now, I think we can all agree that the screening process is a necessary and often a difficult task that the church must undertake. And, of course, the Orthodox candidate would uh, typically expect to be rigorously questioned and sized up. but. What the aspiring priest does not expect from this initial process are the unnatural obstacles, uh, those which aren't directly relevant to ascertaining a candidate's suitability for seminary studies. Now, I mentioned earlier the political litmus test, and let me try to explain exactly what this is. First, the applicant must meet with the vocations director and usually other members of the admissions committee. Uh, each of these people who is charged with assessing the suitability of the candidate asks a series of questions. Obviously, many of these questions are pertinent. How do you pray? Uh, why do you think you're called to the priesthood? What is your relationship with your parish? Uh, things along this line. But too often, I've found, some questions asked of, of, of applicants are used to determine not the suitability of the candidate, but how politically correct he is, or at least how open-minded he is to some of the politically correct agendas of the day. Now here's what this amounts to. If the applicant lets on, and again, this is in certain places, not all, if the applicant lets on that he accepts church teaching, especially on issues of authority or sexual morality, he risks being dismissed as rigid and dysfunctional. Now, let me make this clear. I found that over the past 30 years, many candidates to the priesthood have been dismissed precisely because of political reasons, precisely because they believe what the church teaches. And here are the hot button issues that are brought up in these litmus tests. The first, the ordination of women. Number two, the acceptance of homosexual lifestyles. And number three, the discipline of celibacy in the priesthood. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard that these men, and I'm talking in dioceses and religious orders all across the country, were asked what they thought about the ordination of women to the priesthood. And here's a direct quote from one man who, after years of discernment, applied to enter one of the uh, branches of the Franciscan order. Quote, at the end of the interview, the vocations director truly shocked me. He said, Tim, if you don't believe in the ordination of women, then you don't belong in our order. I left depressed. I wanted to live in gospel poverty. I wanted to forsake wife and children, to preach the teachings of Christ. I wanted to feed the poor with bread and eternal truth. Yet all this vocations director cared about was the acceptance of their redundant political agenda. Now, can you imagine wanting to devote your life to Christ as a priest only to be turned away because you believe what the church teaches about the Catholic priesthood? Is it really fair to be labeled rigid or dysfunctional just because you believe what the church teaches? Well, I think it's, it's not only fair, but many people think it is outrageous. But the fact is that oftentimes, and liberal nuns especially, I don't, I don't see any in the audience tonight, although we wouldn't be able to tell who you are anyway. Uh, but the fact is that uh, many times those who sit on vocations committees are, are looking for candidates who will validate their own political agendas. And, off, and most often this means they're looking for candidates who dissent in some form from the church's teachings or disciplines, or at least for those who are sufficiently clean slates that they can be formed according to those dissident agendas. Now I will address the other two hot button issues uh, under the subject of the second obstacle, which is that of psychological evaluations. Part of the initial application process consists of a psychological evaluation, which is, of course, fair enough. And those with certifiable psychological problems uh, probably don't belong in the seminary studying for the priesthood. 
Uh, this is as necessary and as important as a criminal background check, for instance, of the applicants. But a problem arises when the process is abused. Now, too often those psychologists who are evaluating the candidates are not Catholic or even Christians of any stripe, but often they are agnostic or atheist, which certainly biases the way they evaluate. The uh, psycho psychologist who still to this day evaluates candidates for the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky, as well as uh, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, admitted once to a news reporter, and this was public, pu published in a local newspaper in Cincinnati in 1991, uh, that he, he admitted that he was a fallen away Catholic. He said, one of the things I found I didn't like about religions is they tend to be narrow-minded and exclusivistic. Now, it's interesting, too, that this psychologist was being interviewed because he had just been promoted to worshipful master of the local Masonic Lodge. In other words, this psych yes, you heard me right. This psychologist was a high-ranking member of the Masons, an organization that has long been condemned by the Catholic Church. And he also added that he believes in reincarnation and that he has memories of a past life. And I'm not making this up. Uh, <laughs> I could show you the article. Um, he said, I don't wholeheartedly accept the Christian system of one life, then purgatory, and heaven. Apparently he hadn't heard of hell, but anyway. <laughs> now, is there a problem with a person like this, uh, a man who rejects the church's teachings and believes that he has memories of a past life? Is there a problem with him determining the psychological suitability of applicants to the seminary. Remember, he said uh, he finds all religions narrow-minded and exclusivistic. Even though the Masons, I think they, they, don't, they only let in males, which would be a little bit e exclusivistic, I would think. But can this per sort of person uh, be objective in evaluating candidates who explicitly embrace the teachings of the church? Well, one at least wonders. Now, invariably, many issues of sexual morality come up during these psychological evaluations, as well they should. But uh, too often when the applicant makes it clear to the psychologist that he's ready to embrace lifelong celibacy, he's sized up simply as a nut. Having a disintegrated personality or an immature sexuality, too often when the applicant makes it clear that he doesn't accept the gay lifestyle or homosexual acts, he sized up as rigid and inflexible or unyielding, intractable, and those, all those synonyms, synonyms, synonyms. I just ate. <clears throat> the end result may well be that the applicant is given a very poor psychological evaluation precisely because he is an adherent to what the Catholic Church teaches regarding sexual morality and embraces the discipline of celibacy in the priesthood. Now, the psychological evaluation has been so abused as part of the application process that in 1999, the Catholic Medical Association was moved to write a position paper to address this issue. The paper stated, in part, there are numerous reports that mental health professionals who do not support teachings of the church on sexuality have been chosen to evaluate candidates for the priesthood and reject candidates who do accept the church's teaching on grounds that they are rigid. There are also reports that some mental health professionals do not report homosexual attractions and other conflicts in candidates for the priesthood to diocesan officials or religious superiors. Again, that was written by the uh, Catholic Medical Association in 1999. And what it affirms is that applicants who reveal themselves to have homosexual attractions or present an otherwise perverted sexuality are given the green light while candidates who believe that what the, uh, that, uh, who believe what the church teaches are dismissed as being rigid uh, and intractable. Now something is very wrong here, and the situation prompted the Catholic Medical Association to make uh, the following recommendations. And I quote, mental health professionals chosen to evaluate candidates for the priesthood should as far as possible share the cultural background of the devout, faithful, mature candidates they are to evaluate. The professionals should be Catholics in good standing who support the church's teaching on sexuality, life, contraception, homosexuality, celibacy uh, in the priesthood, the ordination of only men, and the hierarchical structure of the church. 
Now, one of the most significant issues here, especially in light of recent events, is that of homosexuality. If the psychological evaluation process, at least in many places, is weeding out the Orthodox who accept church teaching on sexual morality, and at the same time allowing homosexuals to advance into seminary, you're naturally going to have a problem with a disproportionate number of gay seminarians. And that leads to obstacle number three, which is the gay subculture. Now, two years ago, the rector of the Cleveland Seminary, uh, as I mentioned earlier, confirmed there are many seminary faculties, which include a disproportionate number of homosexual persons. And he commented that straight men in a predominantly or significantly gay environment commonly experience self-doubt. And ultimately, many healthy heterosexual men leave the seminaries precisely because of this gay subculture. And I believe that when Bishop Wilton Gregory went over to uh, the Vatican summit in April, he made the same exact point. And I think this does stand to reason. How can a healthy heterosexual seminarian, in many cases, expect to be properly formed and prepared for the Catholic priesthood when constantly subjected to that, which is so clearly contrary uh, to church teaching? Now, I think that uh, I think this is arguably the, the single most devastating obstacle to priestly vocations. Uh, and to understand the magnitude of the problem, uh, consider this. The gay subculture is so prominent at some American seminaries that these institutions have earned nicknames such as the Pink Palace, uh, Theological Closet, and Notre Flame. Uh, to illustrate the problem, let me quote uh, from a letter written by a former seminarian, now an ordained priest, to his rector. Upon my arrival at seminary, I assumed there would be some gay students. I also assumed that I could handle that. I am a straight man, not a homophobic monster. Still nothing could prepare me for the underculture of homosexuality that has been supported by the formation staff. The other problem is that if a straight student complains about this, he gets blackballed as a conservative. To be at events where guys seem to have their superior supervisor priest's blessing to be out proud and open about their homosexual love life really bothers me, and I am not alone. Now, this letter was written in 1999. At St. John's Seminary in Boston that same year, one seminarian was sexually harassed by another seminarian so threateningly that he was uh, forced to file a restraining order against his classmate. And he did so only after the administration would do uh, nothing to protect him. Uh, but what's even worse than that, I think, is that the victim scolded, uh, was scolded by seminary administrators for embarrassing the seminary. And the harassing gay seminary, seminarian got off with impunity. In fact, the victim left the seminary while the uh, harassing seminarian uh, advanced toward ordination. Now, these are only a few examples. Uh, and believe me, there are many. And if, you, if, if you'd like to know more, you can buy my book if you haven't already. Uh, but I think there are way too many not to take this issue very seriously. Now, on to the fourth obstacle placed in the way of orthodox vocations to the priesthood, open or subtle dissent uh, from the teachings of the Catholic Church in, se in the seminary environment itself. Now, over the last three decades, many seminary faculty members, such as the two I mentioned from the Athenaeum of Ohio and Cincinnati, parrot what might be called the dogmas of Catholic dissent, that the Bible is not to be taken seriously because it's culture-bound. One religion is as good as the next. The pope is not infallible. The magisterium is authoritatively abusive. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is just an old pre-Vatican II myth. Christ was not really divine. God is feminine. Mass is simply a meal. Uh, women should be ordained. Homosexuality is normal. And contraception is morally acceptable, just to name a few. Uh, believe it or not, this has been the standard fare fed to many aspiring priests for the past 30-some years, and it is deadening. Again, one wonders how teaching dissent from the church's doctrines and disciplines can possibly foster vocations to the priesthood. Obviously, uh, a few problems arise. Some seminarians will say, no thanks, soon after they get into uh, uh, being fed these dogmas of dissent, 
And I think that is a, a, a natural response. It's, it's natural to want to run away from what one thinks is uh, offensive. Uh, they leave on their own before getting uh, too immersed in this. Now, other seminarians try to stick it out, of course, and maybe after a year or two they might leave the seminary again um, on their own, but being very much disenchanted with the church, uh, some, some I have interviewed have actually told me that they lost their faith from their experiences uh, in, in the seminary for some time and couldn't even set foot in a Catholic church for months or even in some cases for years. Uh, or that they no longer had any interest in the Bible. Does anybody know who Scott Hahn is? Everybody familiar with Scott Hahn? Well, I, I remember interviewing a young priest who was ordained in 1996, and he told me that when he got into uh, his seminary, he was really on fire about the Bible, about Scripture, and he compared himself to Scott Hahn. And as you probably know, Scott Hahn is very interested in the Bible and Scripture. And after taking a year of his biblical uh, studies course, he said he started to hold the Bible at at uh, arm's length. Uh, the, uh, the, the class had deconstructed the Bible for him and uh, it wasn't until two years after he was ordained a priest that he actually was interested in reading the Bible again, just to, just to show you how serious it is in some cases. Now the third response is to try to challenge what is being taught in seminary. Now the Orthodox seminarian who knows what he, what he is being taught is wrong and goes against the grain uh, the guy who rocks the boat, is uh, he who is tar targeted for uh, persecution and dismissal. Now think about it this way, when you know that something is so very wrong, um, when you know that someone is attacking the church and attacking your faith, it's only natural, I think, to defend what you believe is the truth, to defend the truth. But if you're a seminarian, you are ultimately revealing that you are, in one way or another, a threat to the status quo that you're not a faithful follower of the politically correct agendas that are being endorsed. What then? Now that leads us to the fifth obstacle, and let us call it for the sake of simplicity, the vocational inquisition. Now I want to just use a few examples to illustrate the vocational inquisition. Now consider this quote from uh, an orthodox philosophy professor who for 12 years taught seminarians from the Washington Theological Union in DC. The, philosopher, uh, prof the philosophy professor related that her experiences over the years consisted of a constant stream of seminarians coming to her out of desperation to express uh, their concerns about being uh, discriminated against if they contradict the dominant dissident theories at their seminary. And she said, quote, I have even had students come to me concerned about not trusting their superiors to keep their solemn confidences in confession or in formation matters. Some students have confided, in, uh, confided to me that it was necessary to go to outside confessors in order to find confidentiality, spiritual help, and guidance, which often takes the form of advising the students not to rock the boat or to get out of the uh, Washington Theological Union and into different religious orders that are loyal, loyal to the to the church and would not therefore uh, send to the WTU. Often my orthodox students are publicly mocked by their peers and by other seminary faculty and super, uh, superiors for taking positions consonant with the church's teaching. Accordingly, these students are isolated, left out of programs, meetings, and activities, and made to feel that they are weird. My students also complain of their phone calls and mail being monitored uh, by superiors suspicious of them and antagonistic toward them. Several of her students, the professor related, were actually kicked out of their religious houses because they expressed orthodox opinions that were supposedly dangerous and harmful to other people. Now these opinions uh, would be those uh, teachings you would find in the catechism of the Catholic Church deemed uh, dangerous and harmful to their classmates. In other words, once the seminarian reveals that he is orthodox, he risks uh, being marginalized, intimidated, and persecuted in various ways. Now one of the most notable methods of persecution, if I can call it that, is the sixth obstacle, and that is the abuse of psychological counseling. When the Orthodox seminarian is sent uh, to a psychologist, he's not only embarrassed by this turn of events, he naturally begins to wonder, 
am I crazy? Am I nuts? Uh, although the young man likely considered himself uh, perfectly sane without qualification, before he arrived on campus, he, in the seminary, he now begins to question his sanity. Or if he is still perfectly convinced of his sanity, he is naturally upset and resentful at being a grown man who was made to undergo psychological counseling that he feels is wholly unnecessary. Now here I'm, I'm not talking about the legitimate use of psychological help, but an abuse of counseling when it's used as a form of punishment for not towing the politically correct uh, line at the seminary. In many cases, uh, in fact, the poor psychological evaluations are used to expel uh, the orthodox student. At the age of 44, Father William Hines of the Diocese of Covington, for example, was sent to psychological counseling because he expressed ideas that were not politically correct. For instance, he expressed concern about homosexual activity at the seminary, and re he rejected the views of one priest professor who stated that masturbation was a healthy, positive good. For this, he was sent to 10 sessions of psychotherapy uh, over a period of three months. And by the way, he went to psychotherapy with the same Masonic uh, uh, evaluator uh, at the seminary. But uh, here's what Father Hines had to say about this. He said, quote, had I been 24 years old instead of 44, I would have been intimidated by these counseling sessions. I would not have been able to go in there and deal with a psychologist like that. However, at my age, I knew that I wasn't screwed up and I wasn't intimidated by my failures and my shortcomings. This type of intimidation by psychological pressure, very few seminarians can survive. I'd also like to tell you the story of Father Andrew Walter, who struggled for 14 years to get through the seminary uh, system before he was finally ordained uh, by Cardinal Egan. Uh, when Father Walter was a seminarian at St. Mary's in Baltimore, he was sent to the New Life Center uh, in Virginia for a two-day psychological evaluation. He was said to have behavioral problems. And what were his alleged behavioral problems? Um, defending church teaching and objecting to the gay subculture at his seminary. Father Walter was subsequently diagnosed with severe sexual disorder, uh, histrionic personality disorder, but that's not all. The therapist also included on the list of, the, uh, of his problems, quote, a distorted negative reaction to homosexual behavior in others, and actually accused Father Walter of being a repressed homosexual. Now, a, psycholo a psychologist who later evaluated the same test data used to make this diagnosis uh, concluded that the result of this psychological evaluation was trumped up, uh, calling it a violation of ethics. In other words, Father Walter had been sent to receive uh, a false uh, evaluation in order that the, seminary, uh, that, the, that the seminary would have an excuse to expel them, which, uh, which it did. And in all likelihood, that evaluation would have prevented Father Walter from entering another seminary. Uh, in his case, however, he got a second opinion that showed uh, he had no evidence of any personality disorder. Again, uh, this case is not an anomaly. It's part of a well-documented uh, pattern. And consider this. According to psychiatrist Dr. John Francis, writing in a 1997 article in Homiletic and Pastoral Review, and I quote, if one or two years of psychological counseling on a fee-for-service basis is not successful in alienating the man from his faith in the church, he has given a negative recommendation from the psychologist, which usually means another dismissal and another lost vocation. The Catholic Medical Association also addressed this issue in a position paper on the use of psychological counseling for seminarians. The paper explained that many reports had been made to the association that seminarians who in the course of their studies expressed support for the teachings of the magisterium, the catechism and sacred scripture, particularly on the issues of sexuality and homosexuality, were told that they were rigid and divisive and need psychological counseling or at least a new psychological evaluation. And only when retested after exhibiting signs of orthodoxy were they diagnosed with having serious psychological problems which led to their dismissal from the seminary. 
And here's what the Catholic Medical Association recommended. That seminary faculty should be clearly informed that adherence to the teaching of the church on sexuality and particularly on homosexuality is not a sign of rigidity or mental illness, but of mental health. No seminarian should be referred for counseling or retesting because he supports Catholic teaching, which most of us would probably think is good old-fashioned common sense. Now the last obstacle I want to touch upon is the liturgical and devotional piety, which as uh, you may guess has not been exactly politically correct in uh, many Catholic seminaries for the better part of the last three decades. One priest put it this way, <clears throat> in seminary there were psychological screws under which we seminarians were constantly pressed. The fact was we had to, <clears throat> we had to hide devotion to Mary and to the Eucharist or any other pious exercise of the faith which was not on the list of acceptable activities. Now, oftentimes, seminarians have been denied Eucharistic adoration, praying the rosary in public, uh, kneeling during Mass, receiving communion on the tongue, genuflecting, and so forth. All common expressions of the Catholic faith to you and me, but for the seminarian, it is uh, not supposed to be in many places. And this devotional discrimination appears not only at the level of the seminary, where the seminarian is more or less forced to conform or else, but also at other levels. And returning to Archbishop Curtis's article, he writes, I am personally aware of certain vocations directors, vocation teams, and evaluation boards who turn away candidates who exhibit a strong piety towards certain devotions, such as the rosary. Now again, I think the publication of the Archbishop's remarks was really a watershed event. And he forthrightly identifies a serious problem. And he not only identifies the problem, he also provides a solution, however simple that solution may be. And I'll repeat it once again, orthodoxy breeds vocations. He writes, young people do not want to commit themselves to dioceses or, or communities that permit or simply ignore dissent from church doctrine. They do not want to be associated with people who are angry at the church's leadership or reject the magisterial teachings. They do not want to be battered by agendas that are not the church's and radical movements that disparage their desire to be priests. Now, Archbishop Curtis proposes looking at those dioceses that have a proven record of success when it comes to priestly vocations. And these are dioceses such as Arlington, Virginia, Lincoln, Nebraska, Peoria, Wichita, Omaha, uh, Rockford, uh, for instance. Well, it just so happens that the most obvious common denominator is that these dioceses primarily, though not exclusively, of course, send their seminarians to one particular seminary, one that is, uh, in fact, busting at the seams with aspiring priests, and that is Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Is it a perfect paradise? Probably not. But I think at least it provides a starting point for a model for the Catholic seminaries. Father Kevin Rhodes, rector of Mount St. Mary's, echoed the Curtis thesis when he explained the reasons for his seminary's enduring success. He said, we are faithful to the magisterium and carefully follow all the Vatican documents on priestly formation. No one is in dissent here. And he didn't say only 30% of us are in dissent here. He said that no one is in dissent. And in closing, I'd like to contrast life at Mount St. Mary's with the seven obstacles I presented earlier. And here's what uh, uh, characterizes life for seminarians at Mount St. Mary's. Here's what characterizes uh, a successful seminary. Zeal for Orthodox, Catholic Orthodoxy and traditions, including traditional devotions, for example, public rosary and regular Eucharistic adoration and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, emphasis on personal prayer, holiness, and sanctification through the sa sacraments, especially the Eucharist and penance. Uh, preaching that reinforces and expounds upon the whole of the Catholic faith, including distinctively Catholic doctrines. Strong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, particularly through the rosary and scapular. Uh, five, uh, no flagrant liturgical abuses. Uh, Six, active involvement in pro-life efforts, 
Seven, enthusiasm for evangelization. Uh, eight, a clear priestly identity as the church defines the ordained ministry in all its sacredness and solemnity. And now notice this list didn't include psychological counseling, uh, persecution of orthodox seminarians, or tolerance of the gay subculture. Rather, I think it is at least the beginning of a formula for success. And in the words of Archbishop Curtis, if we are unwilling to recognize the reasons for the, the successes, then we allow ourselves to become supporters of a self-fulfilling prophecy about the shortage of vocations. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and on behalf of Catholic citizens, I'm going to ask you to stand up again and mount these stairs along with us. Can we all three fit? Uh, Mary Ann Hackett and uh, Tom Roser, and on behalf of the board of the Catholic Citizens of Illinois, we present the St. Thomas More Award for Catholic Citizenship to Michael S. Rose, author of Goodbye, Good Men, August 7, 2002, at Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. Okay, now we have uh, some questions, and um, we have taken them in writing, and thank you very much. Uh, please comment on the bishop's chosen panel to solve the problems of sexual abuse in the church. And I would add, uh, one of those panelists is uh, a man who was Bill Clinton's chief of staff, and his name is, he is um, Leon Panetta, so why don't we comment on that? Well, I think that's a good comment right there uh, to, to begin with. Uh, Leon Panetta and some of the others who have been chosen to be on this uh, panel are, are people who may, uh, in one way or another, be uh, singled out as part of the problem. So, um, again, you know, when you're trying to solve a problem, you don't go to the people who have been the problem all along. We're talking about people who dissent from the teachings of the Catholic Church, uh, many people who are, are, uh, are Catholics who have, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, pro-abortion, for instance, um, that's not a good place to start. I, and I don't think there's even any reason to <laughs> go beyond that to uh, to realize that uh, the uh, that panel has not uh, got off to a good start. And that's uh, it's not to say that there aren't any good members of that panel, but uh, I think there could have been many better choices made. Our next question: uh, A letter in the Catholic New World. Uh, criticized you for not verifying information uh, that you included in your book by interviewing um, um, Mundelein's staff. How do you respond to this? Well, yes, it was, uh, there was a uh, review, a book review in the Catholic New World, which was also uh, reprinted in various other places. And uh, it was written by the, uh, it was a very unbiased review, of course, because it was written by the seminary, uh, sem the seminary rector, Father John Canary. <laughs> so, I think that probably answers it right there, but, uh, you know, M Mundelein is obviously criticized in the book, uh, and so is Father John Canary, criticized not by uh, me necessarily, but by many of the students and former students, uh, some of which are priests now, um, in the book. Uh, the, the, you know, the, part of the criticism centers on uh, the fact that uh, I don't come to the seminary rector himself and, uh, and get his denial. But uh, in fact, if you do read the book, and if I would invite Father Canary to read the book, uh, I do present their side of the story uh, from the formation director who denies all of the charges. And the, the, the part, I think one of the parts of the problem, uh, over a big part of the problem over the last 30 years is uh, is, are three things. Uh, one, denial. Uh, two, uh, denial. And three, uh, denial. <laughs> and, and I can't emphasize that enough because uh, there's, uh, there's definitely uh, a willful state of denial that has been going on for the last 30 years uh, when a seminarian uh, or a priest even 
complains about what's been going on in their seminaries. They are marginalized, uh, told that they are nuts or, or so forth. And when a layperson such as many of you out there would, would write to complain, uh, the letters that you get back are, are uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can assure you that this is not happening. Uh, and if it, and if, the, if it is, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to take care of it, uh, which has not been very reassuring for many of us for quite some time. Is it not true that, uh, is it not possible that at least some, some diocese will suffer vocation shortages in the foreseeable future, even if bishops follow your advice? For example, you and Archbishop Curtis both acknowledge the importance of recruitment by a loyal uh, something or other, which is, which is not present in some dioceses. Uh, also, urban dioceses have much I have, I have, many have many fewer vocations than rural dioceses. Uh, yeah, I'll address that last part first. Uh, many people sometimes think that the, the, the uh, larger dioceses might be the more uh, liberal dioceses and have uh, a greater vocations crisis. In many cases that is true, but there certainly are some rural dioceses, for instance, the Diocese of New Ulm or the Diocese of Saginaw, for instance, uh, have hardly any vocations to the priesthood at all. And I can name many others as well. And there are some urban dioceses that, uh, in recent years at least, have been turning around quite a bit. For instance, the Archdiocese of Denver comes to mind, as well as the Archdiocese of Atlanta, Georgia. Those are two uh, large uh, uh, you know, areas. Now, in saying that, I think I forgot what the first part of the question was. Well, I tossed it, so you can forget that, too. <laughs> uh, the opening paragraph of, Channel two, of Chapter 2 states four reasons why young men are discouraged from priestly life. One reason is a feminist liturgy. What is your assessment of a feminist liturgy? Well, first of all, I would say that if, uh, if uh, priests and those who assist the priests at Mass would follow the order of Mass uh, many times, you, you would, you would, it would be much more inspiring for uh, you know, uh, young men who, aspire, who might, may aspire to be uh, future priests. But many times I've found, and I grew up in the 1970s with the banjo music and the uh, James Taylor theology and so forth, and let me tell you, uh, I remember, uh, that stuff didn't fool me when I was a six-year-old. And um, it, 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 drives, it, drives, it, it drove us away. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 32, and I know a lot of my cohort uh, feels uh, quite the same way, is that uh, I think that the feeling was in the 1970s, especially in the 1980s, if we liberalize everything, I mean, it, it, that, that's probably a bad word, but if we uh, do some crazy stuff and, uh, and uh, rearrange the liturgy, we're going to appeal to the younger uh, uh, crowd. They're going to come. And, uh, they, they haven't come, though. <laughs> and, and, the, and the churches that are crowded happen to be those like uh, St. John Cantius, for instance. Uh, locally, I know that they're, you know that they're very faithful to, to the Mass. Uh, and I don't want to just single them out, but I, just, I, I happen to know of them and many other parishes around uh, the country that follow the liturgical ru rubrics don't uh, and, and believe in the sacred and there is a sense of the sacred at mass there is a sense of the presence of God when one comes to mass there is a sense of worship and that's very inspiring for people uh, for religious vocations for pr uh, priestly vocations and uh, in in inspiring also for lay people in in their lives and I know a lot of these parishes uh, that have, are, are very devoted to uh, orthodoxy and as well as uh, an, an orthodox liturgy, liturgy, if I can call it that, uh, d oftentimes have uh, quite a lot of uh, vocations and many people actually come from miles around to these particular parishes uh, because of the orthodoxy and because of the, uh, the sacred liturgy. Okay, I found the card. So uh, the first part of the question was, is it not possible that at least some diocese will suffer vocation shortages in the foreseeable future if bishops follow your advice? For example, you and Archbishop Curtis um, both acknowledge the importance of recruitment uh, by a loyal church which is not present in some dioceses. Comment? Okay, well, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but uh, the, uh, the question, I think, is that uh, if, even if uh, Archbishop Curtis's advice 
is followed in some dioceses uh, that there may still be a vocations crisis. Well, I, I, I guess that's, that's, that could be true because there are other factors involved. But I think the point to be made is that uh, orthodoxy does breed vocations, and I don't think there's any arguing with that. Um, there, you know, and uh, one of the most, I would say, most successful vocations directors in the country over the last 10 years is Father James Gould from the uh, Diocese of Arlington, Virginia. He's not the vocations director there uh, now, but uh, he's, uh, and I quote him in my book as saying, the, the, the formula for success is an unswerving allegiance to the Pope and the magisterial teachings of the church. That is definitely the place to begin. I mean, that's all, that's all I can say. I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't catch in, in, in other ways, that's unfortunate, but uh, that's got to be the starting point, I think. And if I'm not wrong, I think Father James Gould is the nephew of Father Dudley Day. Is that correct? Right. Ah. What is your response to the claim that your book was inadequately researched and anecdotal? Oh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed some of the responses to my book. Uh, my favorite, I think, was the one from uh, Our Sunday Visitor put a little piece in uh, a month after they gave me a fairly decent review, and the second review, I guess they reconsidered or something, it said that I didn't do any original research. Uh, so I called the editor up and I said, if I wasn't doing any original research over the last two years, what have I been doing? <laughs> I said, uh, you know, uh, I, I hired two research assistants. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the claims have been very, very odd, and oftentimes they have come from people who, and in some cases, admittedly so, have not read the book. And uh, I would invite those people to read the book, and they can, I, I present evidence that's not only anecdotal, although there are plenty of anecdotes, because you, I think uh, to get across some of these issues, we really need to hear from the people uh, in the thick of it, uh, personal accounts, but also uh, from previously published sources, um, from uh, documented evidence that's quoted, and from class notes, from, I mean, list, I, list, I don't know how many classes I listened to, notes I reviewed, syllabi, books, and so forth. These are not anecdotal things. These are things that are, that are written in, in, in black and white, and they are presented in the book. Isn't there a danger that if hate crime laws cover homosexuality, criticism of them, and those promoting it will be a crime? It is so in Canada. Uh, yes. <laughs> so sing. For decades, the obstacles, dissent, liturgical abuses, and scandals were known by the Catholic media, yet they remain silent. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because a lot of the people uh, in the Catholic press oftentimes don't want to, uh, I think they look at it as they don't want to embarrass their church. Uh, there, on the other hand, there are, have been uh, newspapers such as The Wander, for instance, for years has been documenting a lot of the problems that uh, have come to light in the Boston Globe and in other places recently. And uh, The Wander is often written off uh, by many in the Catholic Church as being, uh, you know, a little wild-eyed or what have you. But I think they've been vindicated a lot in the last uh, six months or so. And uh, I would, uh, and I would have to encourage the Catholic press to be uh, honesty is the best policy. Uh, we always need prudence, and we need to present the facts charitably and so forth. But uh, I don't think by hiding uh, the truth, anything really uh, good comes of that. I, I, I think we, we we all know that now, after seeing how much has been covered up over the years, and now has been brought to light, uh, and and we can see that. Uh, the worst part of it has been the cover up and uh, that the problems have not taken, uh, have not uh, been taken care of uh, and so forth. Could you comment, uh, do teachers in the seminary and priests put their souls in jeopardy by teaching what they know or should know is not true or are they not culpable because they really believe they are doing the right thing? That's a theological question. Well, it's a theological question, I guess, on one level, and I don't know if I'm prepared to give a theological answer. I'm, but, you know, what I can say about it is I think that, uh, of course, any time that anyone knowingly is... Uh, what, what we're dealing with here are actually some seminary professors, for instance, who are actively undermining the teachings of the Catholic Church. And as I say in the book, uh, it might be a... It might be a uh, 
a, a perk to teach their own uh, theology that doesn't happen to be a Catholic theology. But what they're really, uh, some of them have been doing, so, uh, some by their own admission, is teaching in a Catholic seminary in order to train uh, seminarians not to be priests, rather than to train and educate them and form them to be priests. And of course, I think there's a, a, certainly a lot of culpability that goes along with that and the accompanying jeopardy. Did you collect any data on the Catholic Theological Union of Chicago? It is reputed to be the largest ministry school in the U.S., and it also educates many women with the hope of ordination alongside seminarians. Uh, and some call it a hotbed of dissent. Just today it made news in the Chicago Trib in reference to its former student and canon law professor, Father John uh, Hules, uh, um, the resignation for abuse. What do you know about that? Uh, as I was telling uh, a few folks earlier tonight, uh, I was working with 1,600 pages of notes uh, when I came to writing my book, which is a 288-page book in the hardback edition. But um, there were a lot of things I couldn't follow up on, or I, you know, I just through through time. And the Catholic Theological Union is certainly one of them that I've heard about for years and years. And many of you probably know, may even know more than I do about it. But it does have a very uh, uh, liberal reputation, probably one of the most liberal in the in the uh, when it comes to theology and the disciplines of the church uh, in the country. And I mentioned in my talk the Washington Theological Union, which is very similar. Uh, it uh, the, these two seminaries attract uh, students from uh, not only lay students who are, who are training for various uh, uh, ministries within the church, but also religious orders. Uh, send their uh, seminarians there to be educated in theology, um, and I, I can I can I can't speak to anything more than you know that than, than that. If the people you spoke of who are disloyal to the church are so dissatisfied with the church, why do they stay in the church? Well, I remember uh, when I was on Crossfire, sitting uh, elbow to elbow with Francis Kissling uh, of Catholics for a Free Choice. Uh, Robert Novak a asked her that very question, and she said, "Because I'm Catholic." And uh, I didn't, th <laughs> I didn't think that was a very good answer. But he asked her why she wasn't uh, joining the Episcopal Church because everything that she was promoting uh, apparently has been okayed by the Episcopal Church. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, um, oftentimes they do not want to go and, and, and start their own church or join another church because they lose their bully pulpit, so to speak. The Catholic Church, of course, is a very influential organization, uh, organization institution in the life of, uh, in the life of uh, society. And they know that very well, and it's a very comfortable life uh, for some of these people to be able to use the authority, to have the authority of that institution behind them. And if they were to go to... Uh, to join the, uh, the Methodists, for instance, uh, they may feel that they would not have that uh, same advantage. How many seminaries are there in the United States, and what percentage or number are dominated by a gay culture or a culture of dissent? You have lots of anecdotes, but what are the statistics? I believe uh, that currently there are are approximately 70 major seminaries in the United States. And, um, you know, I, I think sometimes people expect that I should have written a book uh, that's a, a report on, on the, the state of the seminaries type of report, uh, which is not what I did. So I, I don't, uh, I, I didn't go around interviewing with a little, you know, uh, uh, sheets of paper asking questions of every student at every seminary. So I don't have those statistics. Uh, but I can say that. I can say this and on, on a hopeful note, I think that the, the seminaries across the board are at least, uh, I don't know how consoling this would be, but it, at least are improving, and that is across the board, even at some of the, the, uh, the places that have some of the worst problems. I would also say that, the, you know, as I know from personal knowledge and interviews from others, that there are still problems, uh, major problems, with a gay subculture at, at many of the Catholic seminaries. But uh, that said, it's probably much less so than we found in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Uh, was Barbara, what's her name? 
Fionn, appointed by then Bishop Bernardin in Cincinnati? Let's see, she would have been uh, uh, any, 97 minus 17. Who can do that quickly? Yes, well, she, uh, uh, Archbishop Bernardine was, he, Bernardine was the Archbishop of Cincinnati at that time. And uh, I might also add that when he came to Cincinnati, uh, one of the things, first things he did is ask for the resignation of everyone who was working in uh, diocesan offices. And uh, re he accepted many of the resignations. And also, uh, uh, basically, in a couple of years, uh, appointed a whole different faculty at the seminary, uh, closed the high school seminary, and, um, and uh, w some of the results are similar to uh, Sister Barbara Fion and others uh, who had left the priesthood to, to marry, for instance. This is sort of a repeat, but I think it takes an interesting twist. You've been accused of sloppy journalism. Just what were your methods of research and reporting? Um, one of the methods I used was, as I said, the uh, interview process, which is probably what I'm being criticized on most of all. And I, as, I, as I think I said earlier, I conducted 150 interviews over the last um, two and a half years or so. 125 of them were uh, priests, uh, 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 seminarians, or former seminarians. Some were kicked out, and uh, some of the criticism centers on how uh, uh, you know, these, these guys are just have axes to grind, that sort of thing. Well, I would, you know, I would say also that half of those that I interviewed are priests now. And they're, you know, I had to make the judgment as to whether, you know, they have axes to grind or not. And I would say most of those who I met, uh, certainly the vast majority, I would say 99%, did not have axes to grind. They wanted the truth to be told so that, uh, uh, that, that these problems could be taken care of, could, be, could, could have been fixed. Um, uh, could I have interviewed 1,500 men instead of 150? I, I could have done that, yes. It would have, uh, my book would have been out in, uh, you know, 2017 or so, but uh, I mean, you have to stop at, so, at, at some place. And um, again, I think another point to make is that I wasn't writing a State of the Seminaries uh, report. Um, as a matter of fact, Sister Katerina Schuth did that a few years ago with uh, some grant money. And uh, she teaches at, I believe, uh, the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Seminary. And uh, her conclusions were that seminarians are basically ignorant and don't know their faith and uh, are, uh, uh, want to embrace the traditions of Catholicism, which they don't understand. I read the book, and I didn't think it was very helpful. So that book is out there for anyone who, who wants to uh, read that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, state of the seminaries report. Finally, a question from me. If you had a young man who came to you and asked you to list the good seminaries that he could consider entering, possibly three, what would they be and would Mundelein be one of them? Okay, I, I could name three. I mentioned Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg uh, in my talk. I would include that one. I'd also like to mention two new seminaries that have been started in the last few years. One is St. John uh, Marie Vianney Theological Seminary in Denver, Colorado, which was opened by Archbishop Chaput. Uh, I think that uh, definitely promises to be a very good seminary, and I would highly recommend it at this point, from what I know. Uh, from talking to everyone, uh, as well as uh, Bishop uh, uh, Fabian Bruskowitz's new college seminary in Lincoln, Nebraska. So those those would be three right there that I would that I would say are are very good. Uh, the North American College in, in in Rome is often talked about as a very good seminary. Um, I think the, uh, and Ho Holy Apostles Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut is is another one I'd probably put even in front of uh, the North American College. Um, St. Charles Borromeo is sometimes spoken of as a very uh, good place to go. Uh, and it's not without its problems, but uh, I would say that those would probably be the top five there. Uh, Mundelein wasn't and it didn't make the top five. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Marianne Hackett, you have some concluding words. He did a great job. Michael Rose is author of Goodbye, Good Men, How Liberals Brought Corruption into the Catholic Church. It's published by Regnery, online at regnery.com.